to what should be the extent of freedom of speech. In order to debate the issue out in an academic manner, Kiel Isok has brought a panel of representatives, as you can see either side of me, from different religious and non-religious backgrounds together to articulate their respective views and take questions on the issue directly from the audience. Before introducing the panel of representatives, I would first like uh, to thank the Christian Union for their support in bringing this event together, and I would like to thank our panel representatives again for taking time out of their busy schedules uh, to articulate their viewpoints and come here tonight and hopefully answer some very difficult questions. Please feel free to put your hand up and comment and we'll hopefully make it a very lively debate. I must ask everybody to remember we are here to share and discuss ideas and you are almost guaranteed to dislike somebody's opinion. So please refrain from spontaneous explosions displaying your dis disdain against somebody's opinion. <laughs> yeah. And I ask you all to you know, remain polite and civil. I'm sure you all will. Uh, before we begin, I'll introduce the panellists and then the speakers will have a maximum of seven minutes to answer our starting question and then we'll open the floor up to questions and it will begin. Okay, so first I shall introduce Jenny Barton here. Do we will wave? She found her way into the humanist movement at university while she was studying physics at Bristol. She joined the atheist, agnostic and secular society there and it wasn't long before she was president. The following year, she progressed to the president of the National Federation of Atheist, Humanist, and Secular Student Societies, and is currently the head of education. And uh, she has a lot to say on this topic of freedom of speech, as you may have seen on YouTube and other places. Here we have, to my left, we have Rabbi Ahram Cohen, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Ahram. Ahram. The, the anxious. Ahram. The anxious Ahram. Okay. Ah, well, yeah. okay. Uh, he was born and bred in England, as was his father before him. His mother was born in Poland and came here as a child. And his grandparents came to this country from Eastern Europe approximately a hundred years ago. The rabbi is a family man. His children all have families of their own. And being part of the Orthodox Jewish community, he and his family endeavor to live, the lives, live their lives entirely in accordance with the Jewish religion. He trained as a rabbi but was active for many years in commerce. In more recent years, he became more involved in ecclesiastical. 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 I can't say this word, I'm sorry. Ecclesiastical, ecclesiastical duties within the Jewish community and was particularly involved in uh, educating youth. He now spends a lot of his time sp uh, spreading the important but little known message of Zionism and he is one of many Orthodox Jews who completely sympathize with the cause of the Palestinians. A little bit back. We, to my right, we have Abdullah Al Andalusi. He is an international speaker on Islam and Muslim affairs. He defends Islamic orthodoxy from a rational basis and follows Islamic opinions within the main Sunni schools of thought. Abdullah was the former uh, was a former Christian of Portuguese descent, and uh, he embraced Islam after a period of study after uh, since he was ten years old. He has spoken in community centres, universities, colleges, and has numerous appearances on various TV programmes on TV channels, including ITV, BBC Arabic, Press TV, Islam Channel, and Ikra TV. And he has also engaged in a number of debates with atheists, secularists, and Christians on a variety of topics, from theology to political philosophy. In 2009, he co-founded the Public Dis uh, Discussion Forum, which is a, a Muslim the Muslim Debate Initiative, a forum that promotes open dialogue and critical debate between thinkers, academics, and public speakers of all backgrounds. And hopefully you'll be able to find this debate on their YouTube channel, correct? Yep. Hopefully. And uh, he debates issues ranging, uh, for example, with, from the, uh, on the BMP with integration and multiculturalism to the existence of God, to debates, titles, things such as Is Hell Just, and amongst others. To my immediate left, we have Maruf. With a non-sectarian approach, Maruf has established a working record with a number of organisations across the board on the common good, beginning with his Islamic Society at University. He helped establish the Islamic Student Societies for Midlands and founded the grassroots Dawah organisation Al-Hikmah, which is the host to the UK's largest annual Islamic convention entitled United Muslims Convention. 
He is the, also the executive director for the Islamic College of England. Over the years, Maruf, alongside his team, have been involved in hosting some of the most prominent figures of, of, on the Muslim scene, ranging from Dr. Zaki and Naik to the Imam of Masjid Al-Aqsa. On an informal basis, he studies various Islamic sci uh, sciences in the English language for over eight years. His teachers include Sheikh Shaul Hussein Al-Azhari, Sheikh al riya from Jordan, Sidi Azlam, Kari Ismail, Sheikh Hassan Ali, and others. Some, you may know some of these names. Maruf has just begun his voyage on his path of knowledge and intends to grow in his understanding over the years to come. We have our very own Lola, I'm going to get this wrong again, Olugoban. Yes. Although she doesn't sub subscribe to any particular Christian sect, she supposes she'd be described as a Protestant, if anything. Lola is a finalist at Kiel, studying actuarial science. I don't know what that is either. Lola has been on the committee for Jesus Jam, a Christian fellowship, since her second year, and she hosts a radio show on Cube, aptly named Jesus Jam Radio. Its aim is to present Christian views plainly to everyone. Uh, she is also part of the Kiel Mentoring Scheme. She lived in Nigeria for 12 years and plays an active role in the technical team in her home church back in London where her family lives. It's a little biography. Last but not least, we have Matthew Gordon on the far left. He has been heavily involved in the development of mentoring in the UK. He was the youngest member of a small specialist team responsible for training over 7,000 adults across 30 UK universities to become academic mentors. The mentors went on to support 25,000 school children in England and Wales. Since then, he has been involved in mentor development working around the UK, teaching the skills needed to bring the best out of young people and professionals. Through this work, he has had the opportunity to travel to Brazil and South Africa. More recently, he was invited to Princeton University in the US to engage with a range of theological scholars to debate the black minority experience for an Obama era. In addition to mentoring work, he has also worked as a management consultant specialising in governments for both uh, statute, statutory and third sectors, specifically within the Muslim and Christian communities. In 2012, he set up a, this year, he set up a Christian-based debate forum in an attempt to nurture the young Christian voice. And currently, he lives in Wolverhampton with his wife and four children. So, if you remember anything of what I said, it should be a good debate tonight. We've got lots of good panellists with a range of backgrounds. So, each panellist will have seven minutes to answer our first question, which they haven't been told yet, but they, they should probably have guessed what it was. And this is the first question, and we'll start on the far right, if that's okay. Yeah, yeah? why not? Okay, so this is the question. As part of a civilised society, should videos such as The Innocence of Muslims and the Danish and French cartoons, which all aim to mock the Prophet Muhammad or any other Prophet, be allowed under the guise of freedom of speech? I like the word guise. One second. Mm -hmm. I suppose the word guise makes it easier for me to continue. Um, I did think about like, what is freedom of like, speech, that is expression of what you feel or like the opinions you have. And I feel like you should be allowed to do that. But when you have influence on other people, and as human beings, I'm, I might feel like I don't have influence, but if I'm tweeting stuff, if I'm writing stuff up, if it's going in a newspaper, then I need to back up my opinion with fact. And if what I'm saying does not line up with the facts, then it's a baseless opinion, and I, I have no business in sharing that. And so if my opinion is mocking religious, um, what is the word? Religious uh, figures. Figures, thank you. Then, if it doesn't line up with what the belief says, what business have I got sharing that with the rest of the world? I am actually just, I'm pretty much just brainwashing everyone to think how I think yeah. when the facts clearly state something else. Okay. It is, it, it is, it is guys, under, the, under the, the, the heading of freedom of speech. But in the Bible, it talks about lacing your words with grace. It talks about how things are permissible but not beneficial. I am allowed to put up this um, this cartoon and video, but how beneficial is it to the rest of the world? What is the aim of, of me doing this? What would it cause? What are the repercussions of what I'm doing? So 
un under the guise of freedom of speech, I don't think things that will cause such turmoil and mockery to somebody else's belief should be allowed to be done to them. So you think they should be banned if someone makes these kind of cartoons? You don't think they should be allowed? Banned is a strong word. When you ban stuff, it just goes wrong. Like, I feel like people should be educated on the subject. That way, when you're educated, it's not a, it's not a law. If you want to do these things, you, you don't want to be offensive to other people because you've thought about what it is, and based on the facts, that's not correct. So out of logic, as opposed to being banned, you would not put things up like that. Some communities and some people within our communities, they make these cartoons simply to, to, as they want to express that they have freedom of speech. They might not necessarily agree with what they're creating, but they do it because they believe freedom of speech is a fundamental part of this society. So people, for example, like these, do you think they should be banned from producing these type of cartoons? Okay, well, what word would you use then? I think education is key because, like, again, I keep referring back to the Bible, but in the Bible it says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. If you have no knowledge, then spreading the words you have is not helping anyone. Again, the Bible says, zeal without knowledge is useless. You need to, you need to back up what you're saying with knowledge. And even freedom of speech, you are allowed to express what you say, but then there, there are limitations to freedom of speech. There's things like slander, there's things like libel, like definitely. So if, if what you're doing falls under those categories, then legally you're not bound by freedom of speech. So I think you should think about what you're doing. What, what benefit is it to do what you're doing? Once you think about it, what's the motive behind what you're doing? Is it to cause an uproar? Is it to cause like discomfort? What is the aim of that? We should learn about, we should learn to live together and tolerate each other. There is no point in kicking up a fuss just because you can. That's abuse of power and we shouldn't do that. Okay. Do any panellists have any comments on your um, So, one of your key points is that it would be nice, wouldn't it, <laughs> if everyone would just not be nasty to everyone else, but sometimes you need to say something that is very offensive to a group of people in order to defend another group of people, for example. Um, you can't, I guess you can't just paint it as a black and white picture. Um, I think the most important thing, I guess, the, I don't know what your name is. Sean. Sean. Sorry, I'm what? Sean everyone. Okay. <laughs> um, Sean, Sean brought this up in one of his questions to you, which was, um, some people say freedom of speech for the sake of freedom of speech and I think to an extent we need we need to be able to defend freedom of speech um, for its own sake um, it's unfortunate that some people choose to do that in a way which is quite hateful um, but the law is there again there are limitations on freedom of speech if you are inciting hatred against a group of people, if you are inciting people to act, that's very different to saying this group of people... Well, actually, in the case of depicting Muhammad, it's not this group of people, it's this figure who a group of people respect, um, which isn't actually directly attacking the group of people, it's attacking their beliefs. So you're not actually attacking a person, which is an important distinction. So rather than victimising people, you're challenging an idea. And ideas are abstract things which, within freedom of speech, can't, well, within a free society and within the law, are not currently protected, and I feel it should probably stay that way. I don't know if you want to come back again. Can you just repeat the question so I just... The question, uh, as part of a civilised society, should videos such as The Innocence of Muslims and the Danish and French cartoons, which all aim to mock the Prophet Muhammad, and anything like them, which aims to pro uh, mock a prophet or religious figure, be allowed under the guise of freedom of speech? Okay. I suppose the first question I would ask is, who controls this civilised society that you refer to? Okay, uh, well, in our case it would be this society. But in general, a society, 
should should they be allowed in the Well if that civilized society that you're referring to is civil society, then I have no real control of that. And so how they govern the country, um, the continent, the area is it's completely up to them. It's it's not my like call. So in answer to your question, yes, if that is civil law and it, it, uh, people are allowed to express themselves, have freedom of expression, which would be freedom of speech, then yes. Now, in terms of Article 10 2 of the uh, ECHR, it's freedom of expression isn't an absolute right, it's a qualified right, so there are conditions associated with that. So if you're John Terry and you think you've got freedom of expression, you might get in trouble because it's not an absolute right that you can say what you want. Then there are conditions attached to that. So whoever um, wants to insult another should be aware that you can say what you want, but there may be consequences. But if, if we are saying, should they have a right to say what they want, then yes, of course. Well, the uh, freedom of speech, what an interesting euphemism. Um, I would say that freedom of speech doesn't exist. We all know this. There's limits. In fact, freedom doesn't exist. You know, there's, there's all kinds of laws, including the natural law of the universe, which restricts us as, as human beings. So everything, there's no such thing as freedom. But it's a nice euphemism to use to make ourselves feel a little bit better, or maybe civilizationally superior, perhaps, saying that we're special, maybe we have more rights. But really, what has just changed uh, with the adoption of freedom is just the taboos have changed. So taboos were no longer rooted in uh, the values of Christianity, but are now rooted in the values of um, secular humanism or humanism of, of some kind. Now, when dealing with the issue of the film The Innocence of Muslims, and I would, I would disagree, the, the, the title of the film is not The Innocence of Prophet Muhammad or The Life of Prophet Muhammad or the, you know, what, what happened in, during the life of Prophet Muhammad. It's The innocent of, Innocence of Muslims. So if I, if I wanted to do a video about Moses and I showed him being a bloodthirsty barbarian or warlord and then I called it The Innocence of Jews, you know, am I, can I say, I'm not attacking a group of people. No, no, I'm just a just, just, you know, historical critique of Moses, that's all. But why would I call it Innocence of Jews? And then I talk about Moses very specifically. It's just, just specifically him and demonizing him and saying, saying very bad things. Of course, there were people who did cartoons and uh, did uh, documentaries and wrote texts about a minority living in the West. And this is, we noticed in the 1930s and 40s. They exercised their freedom of speech. They even said they had a right to say it under freedom of speech. And we all know who they are, which is obviously the, the commonly uh, cited uh, Nazis. Um, but they exercised it and they created such a mass hysteria amongst the average German, the average liberal German, by the way, that it caused a genocidal massacre. And now what we're seeing is now under the same kind of very similar economic conditions, uh, we're seeing a, a rise of this hysteria again another Semitic religion, a minority, and you know, lo and behold, even the arguments they use is exactly the same. This group of people, you can't trust them, they're a fifth column, uh, they, they want to take over the world, their, Bible, their, their book compels them to do this. Exa identical, quote for quote, with um, what the Nazis said about Jews. In fact, even the guy who uh, published uh, in, in German, I think, the, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion, which was an anti-Jewish book, um, you know, there was, uh, no, Jews weren't happy about this, and that guy himself, um, like, uh, was it Theo van Gogh himself, also got, was, was killed by a Jewish guy. And the Germans said, look at the Jews, look at them. Yeah, look how violent they are. Look how they suppress our freedom of speech. It, it's, it's history repeating all over again. So I think that if, if we want to repeat history all over again, then sure, have this freedom of speech and say whatever you want and demonize um, you know, uh, whoever you want all the way to the gas chamber. Or you can say, wait a second, maybe, maybe we should learn from history and maybe you shouldn't just hate people and you shouldn't just uh, say anything you could because people, uh, human beings are not fully rational beings. We, we can act on ignorance, we can act on hysteria and we can do very horrible things to people we think are, are a threat to us. So we say, oh, these Jews amongst us, or these Muslims amongst us, or these Irish amongst us, or these blacks amongst us. They're, they're the problem is with Britain, we have to sort them out. And we know where that leads. So all I'm saying is a bit of common sense. And more importantly, um, we can, you know, as they say, the, uh, the sword, uh, sorry, the, the pen is mightier than the sword. So why do we keep focusing on the sword, but uh, ignoring the pen? Well, this, doesn't the pen sign, sign the deaths of millions under the sword? Just quickly. Yeah, sure. um, 
I definitely agree that um, the kind of anti-Muslim sentiment that we see in the media a lot at the moment is toxic and is leading to you know, general, like I, at humanist events, I've had people come up to me and say, oh, the Muslims are going to take over the world, we've got to like, counteract this somehow. And it's like, you're, you're like a nice, aren't you saying? Okay. Um, and like, it just comes out of nowhere from people that you would not expect. Um, and I think it's a separate issue from, so that, that's like a larger issue. The, the, the media can't just be prevented from talking about anything in the Middle East, for example. Um, it's, it's a really, really subtle problem and I don't know how we can tackle it, but curbing freedom of, spe of speech against, like, you know, saying bad things about Muslims overall is probably too much of a blanket thing to do because it would mean that, for example, uh, if there was a massive terrorist attack and Muslims were perpetrators, you wouldn't be allowed to comment on it and kind of what, how do we draw the line? It needs to be much more gentle is what I'm saying. I don't know, if we, I actually don't know how, but it's, yeah. Mm. Again, I think this is where education comes in key. Like, you have to educate yourself on the, on the subject you're talking about. Do not speak about something you, you can't back up. Why would you do that? It's, That's it's, not the point. But it's completely basic. But I see what you're saying, that's not the point. But okay, there's a terrorist attack. They happen to be Muslim. That is in black to every Muslim out there. You should make sure you should get the facts and get it straight. You do not write a headline to sell papers, you write a headline for the truth. You should, that's, that's, that's how it should be. The truth is absolute. There is only one truth. It's not subjective, it's subjective. Say the headline, say it as it is. It is then up to you to make an informed decision from that. If you cannot do that, then why do you have, you shouldn't be speaking, it sounds a bit harsh, but. Mm. My, my comeback to that is that the Daily Mail already exists. <laughs> um, and we can't, we can't just say, no, Daily Mail, all of you are obviously like inciting and under, there's like why undercurrents. why can't you do that? Well, because it's a legitimate newspaper and Whilst a lot of the things they say are <coughs> sensationalist, um, that they're, they're not actually breaking English law. And if they're not breaking English law, then unfortunately they are allowed to publish what they're saying. So you either have to say that, that um, we make this illegal, or that we have to deal with the fact that people are really irresponsible and stupid. Okay, I think we'll end that one there. Um, <laughs> could you do your seven minute introduction into this topic? I know we've kind of divulged. I thought, I thought we were spending seven minutes on the question. It's kind of, you can say your part now instead oh. of commenting. Well, each, each person gets oh, okay. seven minutes to answer the question. <laughs> I see. This will take a long time. Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I have anything. I think I should pass and just comment on other people. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> um, okay. Um, as, as I said before, the you know, issue of uh, freedom of speech is it, it, it's very curious to how it kind of snakes its way around the taboos of the society. So the taboos of the society uh, cannot be spoken out against. So if you want to take coffins down Wooten Bassett to show about the casualties in the war or burn a poppy, uh, then that's a taboo in this society and you can't do that. But if you want to uh, go against the taboos of other societies or other people, that's fine as long as it's not a taboo of this society. Now I know there's difference of opinion amongst uh, people in this society as to what should be sacred or not. Uh, but uh, some very interesting points. There are certain things which we know are sacred, uh, such as um, no one says that, well, you shouldn't have racial hatred laws because that impinges free speech. If, if someone wants to insult or uh, make a derogatory comment or discuss maybe pseudo scientifically the inferiority of various other races except, let's say, the white English race, they should be allowed to do so. And you can, you can hear these people on YouTube attempting to do that, but not saying it out outwardly because they know they're going to get arrested, which is why we have these laws. They restrict your speech. So they try, they try to, they try to um, disguise in all of the, all the ways, but they are saying that basically uh, people are saying that why don't we just get rid of the racial hatred laws because it's a legitimate area of inquiry. Um, obviously, public order offences. So, you know, as you know, you're prohibited from using uh, insulting and abusive language and of course to cause harassment, alarm and distress. People say that you can't restrict freedom of speech 
when it comes to offense because offense is subjective. Well, okay, fine. I, I don't actually take the view of the issue of offense. I take the view of the intent to insult. That's a, a much more cast iron definition. I don't mind if, if someone says something I don't like to disagree with, but if they intend to insult me, uh, then uh, as a human being, uh, I, I feel humiliated, I feel degraded, and every human being naturally requires respect. It is a part of our human nature. Any law that uh, doesn't grant that to a human being is going to have a lot of trouble. So, uh, but in the current law, courts have to determine, you know, what is a, a distress, what is alarm, you know, it, what is it, abusive language. The courts decide it currently. So you can't say, even the argument of saying, oh, abusive language, um, or offensive language is ambiguous. Well, the courts decide ambiguous terms all the time. Obviously, that's public order offences. You've also, I mean, I could continue, you've got libel and slander. Uh, you've got uh, the, the various uh, sexual harassment, which, funnily enough, says that if a person creating an offensive environment for a woman, for example, uh, based on her sexuality is, uh, is breaking the law, the sexual harassment law, an offensive environment. Interesting. Well, what's offense? I thought we couldn't define it. So there are so many laws. I mean, obviously there are kind of things that, that, that go for the privacy laws, the Data Protection Act. You can't just speak someone's private information to other people and, and so on and so forth. And, and in terms of damages under libel and slander, we know that there are things such as injured feelings and disappointment or injured reputation. These things are, are not tangible. You're not physically harming them, but injured feelings will grant you damages in a, in a law of court. So, so um, court of law, sorry. So this is the kind of things that we actually uh, find in, in the current legal system. And it's based on the application of law on humans. So human beings, what is the natural, or forget your ideals, what are humans? How do they react? What is human nature? This is where I wanted to bring the discussion to. And if you want to live in a society where everyone has well-being, and but everyone's insulting each other and degrading each other, and of course the strongest faction will, will have more hits than the, than the weaker faction, so the Daily Mail, for example, will be able to, to demonize a lot of people and support um, you know, fascists as they historically have done, like the British Union of Fascists, and even Hitler, the Daily Mail, uh, historically supported them up until World War II, coincidentally. So these are the issues, you know, these are the things that you can't have absolute freedom of speech because humans don't act rational a lot of the time. They go on ignorance. You know, the, um, uh, my, you know my Christian sister there said, said a very good point. You said that you shouldn't talk about knowledge, but everyone thinks they know it all. And everyone thinks that not only do they know it all, but you, they have, you have to listen to them explain to you how they know it all. And when, they, and when they think they know it all, they all think, it, it might think that Jews are a problem, Muslims are, are a problem. And they have to tell the world, I have to tell the world that Jews and Muslims are a problem, otherwise they're going to take over the world and we'll all be speaking Hebrew and Arabic in 20 years' time or something like that. Right? Creeping, uh, was it Sharia or Halakha, whatever. So these are the kind of things that you, we have to, you know, uh, uh, really deal with restricting to prevent uh, inter-ethnic conflict into community conflict and actual fighting, actual killing. You know, it's happened in Bosnia, it's happened in Guatemala, it's happened in Rwanda. We all know, know that, uh, was it Hate Radio in, in, uh, in Rwanda, which talked about the, the uh, Tutsis as cockroaches. And, uh, and then we all know how that got the Hutus into a frenzy, and then there were massacres that, that, that occurred. And I'm not saying massacres are going to occur, but I am saying that it's, there's going to be fighting, there's going to be uh, mosques getting, getting uh, firebombed, people getting shot in a Sikh temple because they thought it was a mosque. Um, interesting enough, during you know Nazi Germany era, synagogues were firebombed, Jews were shot and stabbed on the streets. Uh, they used to say that basically, if you saw Jews in an area talking to an Aryan girl, they're, they're trying to rape her, they're trying to have sex with her. Where, where have we heard this before? You see, it's recurring. Now, if you want to continue, you want to continue this cycle of hate and hysteria, then fine, have these you know unrestricted uh, you know uh, freedom of speech laws. But if you want to have a, a civilized society which cares for the well-being of the citizens, you know, you have to restrict this. Now, I'm going to say, I've talked about restriction, let's talk about what I should be allowing. Um, unfettered intellectual criticism, that's fine. If, you know, if my colleague here wants to say that, you know, she doesn't believe in God, she thinks it's a ridiculous concept, it's an absurd concept, and that I'm following a book written by some guy in the desert, that's fine, that's intellectual, that's her intellectual uh, criticism. I accept that, I'm not offended. She's an atheist, of course she's gonna say that. She's, not, she's hardly gonna testify the testimony of faith, is she, <laughs> in Islam? So, I understand that. <laughs> and the, the, when the, as a Muslim, uh, I take this values from the Prophet Muhammad Sallam, who organized the first ever Muslim Christian debate in the first ever mosque with the Christians of Najran. And these, it was for a three day debate and they, you know, at the end of it, they, didn't, you know, they denied it to his face that he said, you know, we don't think you're a prophet, i.e., you know, must be a false prophet then. 
And he didn't get offended. He didn't say, right, you know, kill these guys or attack them or, get, or have a riot. No, he, actually, at the end of it, they concluded a peace treaty. And, you know, they went on their way. He even said before leaving, if they'd like to pray their Christian prayers in the mosque. That was before leaving, because it was a long journey. This was the example of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'll, I'll end on this, on this example of Islamic uh, tolerance, and just to show our consistency in this. Um, as monotheists, as very pure monotheists, one of the most abhorrent current concepts to us theologically is polytheism. You know, we, we, we have an intellectual abhorrence uh, to polytheism. But the Quran says, referring to dealing with Muslims, how they should deal with polytheists, is do not insult their idols. Lest they insult Allah in their ignorance. Lest they insult you, your one God in their ignorance. So treat others as you wish to be treated. So don't insult them. But the Quran is full of, you know, critique, intellectual critique of polytheism. But it never insults them. And isn't those civilized values that we could adopt? Maybe this is some civilized values that we can learn from so that we can have uh, free speech, which I might add, the purpose of free speech is the pursuit of truth, not the pursuit of playground activities. Right? It's the pursuit of truth. So we can have free speech for the pursuit of truth, but let's cut, let's, let's cut down on the, on the, on the uh, you know, ideological Tourette's and on, on the insults and actually just deal with the matter at hand and respect each other as human beings. You, might, you don't need to respect the belief, but you should respect the human beings who hold that belief. Thank you. I want to start off by looking at how did the laws of freedom of speech come into power. Now what we realized to, was the situation, especially in America and prior to the French Revolution, was that people who spoke out against government or state or the church disappeared. They were being arrested, persecuted for, for exposing any government issues or speaking out against the government. And in order to protect these people who spoke out and showed their objection against the government, the, the First Amendment in the American Constitution came about and likewise the laws in Britain and France. However, Islam didn't really have this problem because from day one, from the time of the Prophet and the rightly guided caliphs that came after, uh, to voice your position against the state or the religion was something that was accepted. Uh, as long as it's done in a legitimate manner. And we've got various examples of this in the Muslim tradition. For example, Umar radiallahu who was the second caliph of Islam. He was the religious and political leader of the time. He got in a Friday sermon, and in Muslim custom, we have uh, when a man and woman get married, a man gives a woman a dowry, a marriage gift of a certain value, which is negotiated between the two. And what was happening during that time, women were negotiating high amounts making it you know making it very difficult for like somebody to get married like it's like oh my god i'm gonna have to fork out so much money to marry her so he wanted to deal with this in society and he he came out saying that we need to limit the amount of money that women can ask for and this was done in a friday sermon and a woman women this is a woman about 1400 years ago got up to the head of the state and the head of the religious power at that time and she said Oh, Umar, who are you to put a restriction on something that Allah has not restricted upon us? And Umar turned around and said to the woman, the woman is right and Umar has been defeated. And he sat down accepting her criticism and changing the policy. So you, you see, such valid criticism of the state or valid opposition to religious or political power is something that Islam has always allowed. But it has to be legitimate and done with the intent to improve society. Now, if you look at the videos of innocence of Muslims and you know the cartoons that came out, why is it that Muslims are so offended? Well, first of all, we wouldn't. It's not just restricted to Muslims wanting an exclusive protection against insults to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. We would be just as offended with any criticisms against Prophet uh, Moses, against Jesus, and even prophet, people that we don't regard to be prophets, like. Guru Nanak and so forth. You cannot mock and insult people, and especially with lies. And if you, if anyone's watched the Innocence of Muslims or the cartoons, they will see this is just like pure mick take and pure factual lies. You know, the Prophet is depicted as a homosexual in the Innocence of Muslims. Um, his, you know, the stuff I would don't want to repeat what's in there, but they're factual lies. It's not an opinion that's come about through any documented facts. 
And likewise in the cartoons, you know, like the, the Danish cartoons that came out, they showed Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu we're in a suicide bomb. Now, you know, what kind of, you know, criticism or intellectual discourse is this? This is pure mic-taking and reinforcement of negative stereotypes of Muslims in the media. And this is what we oppose, and it's not restricted to just Islam. We would restrict any mocking and, you know, mic-taking of any prophet or religious figures. And, you know, and you have to realize why Muslims feel so hurt when this, this happens, because we are taught to love the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, more than ourselves. So just imagine if somebody came out, published photos, published you know, insulting comments about your daughter, your wife, your child, how would you feel? And going back to the question, in a civilized society, do we want to be able to do this? Is it civil to go out and insult people's daughters? Is it, is it civil to go out and insult people's wives? Is it civil to go out and insult people's mothers? And most of you, I'm sure, would not go out and do that randomly, baselessly. Now, if we wouldn't do it to, and from an Islamic perspective, if you wouldn't do it to somebody who's related to you or somebody who's closer to you, Prophet Muhammad, somebody who is more dearer than that, I would personally, even though I wouldn't accept it, I would personally have somebody insult my own mother than insult my Prophet. And this is the pain we feel when such false accusations and mictake has been done against Islam. Jenny has a comment. Yeah, um, just, this is a comment really for both of you two. Um, I was really, um, when you started speaking, um, the kind of roots of freedom of speech in, well, we've got to be able to defend ourselves if we're being oppressed. Um, I guess the, the problem is, whilst we all know that Muslims are plotting to take over the world, how, do, how does that guy who's convinced himself that that's true know um, like he, he can, he's actually convinced that this is true and he wants to tell the world, um, whilst it's not actually like you're going to just say, oh, well, He's just been miseducated. Yes, there are crazy people all the time who've been miseducated, and but the problem is, it's very difficult for society to say you're wrong and you're right if, like, there are a lot of people who believe something that's probably wrong, um, like all Muslims are going to kill everyone. Um, but we need to be able to defend ourselves if that's true. So how do we actually, like, I'll ask you, how do we make the law defined so, rather than in terms of offence and whatever, like, what are you allowed to say? Um, like, it should, I, I suppose it should just go through courts and if it's demonstrably proved to be false, as is the case with Anders Brevik, the Norwegian chap, um, I guess that's probably a good example a counter-example, where he has worked himself up into a massive frenzy and the courts of law have actually taken him through and said, no, no, we don't actually think that Muslims are going to take over Norway. Um, but kind of, there's, there's got to be middle ground where you can't defend yourself without free speech, but you still need to be able to offend people for that. Yeah, I'll answer that question. Yeah. <laughs> okay. You've got made a valid point, if some, and I think uh, Abdul has answered this to some extent. If somebody has a fear or a concern, Muslims are not saying you cannot do this in an academic manner. We've got years and years of Orientalists criticizing Islam, you know, people you know, dismantling Islamic tradition and so forth. And any intellectual criticism is, is a valid thing. And you know, I would not be offended if you came to me and said, I don't believe that this man in the middle of a desert 1400 years ago came out with this book. You know, and then you try, try and explain your, your reasons why. There's no, we're not opposing criticism and we're not opposing, opposing you, know, you to express your opinion. What we're opposing is you taking a mick. And just like you would appreciate that I, you know, I, you know, I might find something about you which is distasteful and I can say that in a nice manner and then I could go out and take your photo, print it out, you know, abuse you. And we've actually got laws in this country that protect, you know, libel laws and so forth, that will protect individuals who are alive. But, you know, when it comes to protecting somebody who's deceased, such as the prophets, it doesn't extend to protecting them. So we're not saying don't criticise us. 
We're saying we'll actually give you the platform. You know, if you know Richard Dawkins wants to come, we'll set up a debate with Richard Dawkins if anybody wants. We'll give you the platform to criticise us, but do it in an academic manner. We have a count on. Can we? Uh, do you want to come back on that? Um, As in, why is it different when someone is deceased, deceased or and someone's alive? Well, the deceased one I haven't thought about. Um, I'd like to think about that and come back later, probably at some stage. Okay. No, um, I think it's a really valid comment. But uh, in that case, should all satire of everything ever be banned? Like, um, I don't know. There are a lot of satir like comedians saying a lot of things that are quite taboo. And should, should everything like that be banned as well under, under this, I guess, is my question. But, yeah. um, again, in this civilised country, I think we're all operating on the, uh, the assumption that human beings are just happy, chappy, great, like, we get bored and we're just nice people. It's not, it sounds a bit harsh, but it's not in our nature to be nice. We get taught to be polite, we get taught to be considerate. But when you're being taught to be polite and considerate and there is a problem with your law, it's not in your nature to be nice. So clearly, it's not going to be a thing of, okay, so where are the rules, where are the restrictions? This is where, for me, this is where Christianity comes in. And out of the issues of your heart, this is like, that's what comes out. So in the Bible, it says, think, think of things that are pure, think of things that are thoughtful, think of things that will not hurt others. If that's in your heart, then we wouldn't have a discussion about what can we say, what can we not say, because in your heart, you don't want to cause Tolerant, you want to cause hate. It says in the Bible, love, you, like, love your enemies. Those who, it says, those who slap you, turn the other cheek. If you have that in your heart already, there will be no need for oh, what can we say, what is this law about? It's all about the issues of our heart. We're one of the, I suppose we're, we're assuming that when we are born, we're just born as nice people. We're not. I, I, I can't stress that. <coughs> Thank you. I, I have I've listened with interest um, and you know, I've heard the points about what the Daily Mail does. I've heard the points about intellectual critique, is that correct? Um, and analysis. And I think they're all sound and noble points. But let's be clear, it's, it's not going to happen. You live in a society where insults and sensationalism sells and that is the world that we live in. We have to accept that we live in a community where people are nice, they're abrasive, they are untruthful, they are sinister, they treat individuals, they treat their friends with contempt, let alone people who they don't consider friends. I think it's our responsibility for whatever belief system you come from to recognise that it's down to your individual self to withstand that vile venom. That's your responsibility. One of my favourite uh, events was the, the uh, it's an example that I'm, I want to share with you, is between Muhammad Ali and uh, George Ford. And the way that Muhammad Ali was successful in that fight was that he was able to disturb George Foreman with insults. And that is how he got him out of his game. He was able to talk about how slow he was, how thick he was. He was just downright rude. But I sense that that's what's happening um, in this debate, that the insults that are coming externally are upsetting what you do internally. And surely that can't happen. Surely in your belief system, or in my belief system, we are to expect that people are going to be sinister and they're going to try and uh, disrupt us. But it's down to us as the individual to gird ourselves and say, actually, I'm going to move forward irrespective of the nonsense that you're spewing. Now, we can't expect, or I can't expect, for somebody else to alter their course however sinister it may be, it's down to me as an individual to withstand that. Now for me to say, you must be bad, well, I can't see how that can fly myself. I think it's my responsibility, however difficult, I'm not saying that it's not difficult, however, it's my responsibility to develop um, enough character to withstand anything that 
the outside world throws at me. And I'm not saying for one moment that it's appropriate uh, and it's right, but it's that's not my call, what that person does over there. And I think that's really um, what we should focus on, our ability to withstand the venom that may come your way throughout life. Basically, from what you, you said, I understand you, you're basically saying that regardless of how it should be ideally, the reality is that people are going to mock and take the insult and we need to accept that. But also the reality is that people are going to rape, we're going to have paedophiles in our society. Do we just accept that and not put laws in place to prevent and protect these people? We have got laws. Exactly. We and have we got laws. This is my point. We have laws to protect you know, children. We've got laws to protect women from being raped. But we don't have laws to protect what you and I have both agreed is an insult and shouldn't be allowed among civilised people or it's something that civilised people shouldn't do. But we've got no law to protect that. Why should we not have laws that protect people who are dead but we have laws that protect people who are alive? We have got laws to protect freedom of expression and privacy law. We have got laws to protect freedom of expression and freedom of assembly and all those things, freedom of thought. We have got those laws. What we're saying, what I'm saying to you is that because we have those qualified rights, it might not always be nice. And so it's our responsibility as believers to say, this is something that I must personally say to that yet. I can't control what happens outside of my domain. Um, what, is in, what is in within my control and within my remit is the ability to withstand the barrage of abuse um, which falls outside of civil law. If it's something which is contrary to the law of the land, then that's for the authorities to deal with. Now, I'm not saying it's easy, but that, that, those are our options. But I think we have to stop you at the moment. Just a very, I mean, a very key point. Why don't we go to um, you know, Africa, be members of this community, and say, you know, we shouldn't. Uh, ban anyone from uh, insulting your race or your colour or, or the, the shape of your nose or any of these things. We should let them do so and you must be thick-skinned about it. You must withstand the barrage of those insults against you. That's yeah? not what I'm saying. Uh, no, no, okay, okay, I know, I know, I know. I know. But, okay, I know. But you see, well, we... you know that you should... We, no, no, wait, 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 wait. No, because Let you see, the thing, is, the thing is this. We have uh, restrictions on what you can insult in this country. You can't, you can't insult any aspect in this country of, of, a, of a human being. Generally speaking, the restriction is that if you, if you insult uh, what is common to a community, so for example, race is common to a, a community, so you can't insult that. The reason being is because you don't want to be, uh, you want to prevent, uh, you know, people feeling humiliated, um, you know, offending their, their, or hurting them, them at their kind of need for respect. So this is, you have these limitations. And these limitations are there. Now I say, well, you had this for race, and we know that the British uh, Parliament tried to, to do the same for, for religion with the you know religious hate uh, laws, uh, but uh, obviously there was a lot of protest as to uh, it was worried that you, it would, uh, you couldn't criticize religion after that, which I don't think was the case. But basically, what defines you more, your belief or your skin color? What defines your identity and personality more, your skin color or your belief? It's your belief. Yet you can insult that, which defines you as a human being, or and a community, but you can't insult a superficial aspect of yourself, which is just your skin colour. It's like saying we should have a law against uh, hating people with blue eyes, or, or gingers. <laughs> All right? You know, th th this is I'm saying that look, um, either you equalise the laws for race, the, the, you know, the race hate to um, hating a group of people on, based on their religion, or inciting hatred against people because of their religion. Or you abolish all of it. Be consistent. That is all you know, we're asking. You, know, you are correct, my, my colleague over there is correct, that whatever we say today is not going to have that much effect on the political system in this country. And there is sensationalism. Uh, and we, there are media moguls and people who basically um, you know, sensationalize themselves. And that's business, that's capitalism and so on. That's true. But we are having a discussion as to, to, as to what is moral and what should we do. And if we already have laws in place that restrict hate speech, against the community of people for something which is superficial then we should have by uh, logical extension laws that ban uh, hate speech against, against the very identities of people what makes them who they are can i take the question over there please uh, who's uh, i take it no, Um, there's a few things I've been saying. Um, the 
lips can change through discourse to what the skin colour can't. Um, that's why they should be attacked. Um, if your beliefs are wrong, they should be accepted to be attacked. The other thing is, lots of people have said that the, the truth of a statement matters and the benefit it has to society matters. If a statement is untrue and has no benefit, it should be banned, like creationism. Um, should the religious also not be allowed their hate speech? Should priests not be allowed to say that gay marriage is wrong? Um, gay marriage is something that is a big part of people's belief because of their personal identity. Should imams and priests be allowed to say that gay marriage is wrong, being gay is wrong? And if so, why is that different to me saying, oh, I don't believe in your prophet? Uh, from now on, I think if you can just speak up and then I'll repeat the question so everyone else can hear because it's a long transition. Uh, I'll let Abdullah answer that and then I'll we'll go brief. to the rabbi. I'll be very brief. You say, yes, this uh, argument, beliefs can change, uh, but uh, skin colour can't change, and that's an argument. Okay, well then why not we, we uh, persecute people for their beliefs because they can change. You can force convert someone to become atheist or Christian or communist or whatever. Because they can change, it's a matter of choice, it's not a matter of something they can't, you know, that they, that they have, that they, you know, it's not immutable. No, you, if I, I mean, I, I can't tell this person next to me to stop believing in God, and she says, yes, yeah, it's just a matter of my choice, I just chose to not to believe in God. No, she's not, she's probably not convinced. And she probably will say that there is no evidence that she has convinced her. So it's not a matter of choice for her, because she's just not convinced. That's what she'll say. It's not a matter of choice. Your beliefs are, you follow your conscience. And you're, you don't have a choice in your conscience. If you do, then you're a cynical hypocrite, <laughs> basically. And if, unless you want a society that rewards cynical, cynicism or, or hi hypocrisy, you know, you should have, uh, uh, have a society, you should advocate a society whereby people can be principled people, hold their beliefs, not be coerced out of them. So there is, it is uh, different. And besides, I could answer you back in terms of you know, uh, skin color change. Someone could say Michael Jackson. Yeah, but we won't go there. Anyway. <laughs> Um, when it comes to truth and untruth statements, um, I didn't say ban something because it's true or not true. I didn't even say that those people who think that Muslims are trying to take over the world, uh, that just by saying that per se, that should be banned. No. What I'm saying is uh, insult, gratuitous insult, it serves no intellectual purpose. No one can, I mean, I, I'm, I wait someone to, who can rationalize to me why gratuitous insult must be allowed, how it serves some great purpose. I, use any basis you want. If you want to use utilitarianism, please do so. Use natural law theory, please do so. But please tell me from any basis why gratuitous insult should be allowed, but um, uh, even though it serves no intellectual benefit and purpose. And what I mean by gratuitous insult is um, insulting uh, beliefs which are held sacred, wherever they might be. Now, yeah, fine, insult. Prime ministers, if you wish, insult, whoever, you know, um, presidents, if you wish, and so on. that's fine. I suppose that's part of the culture now. But, um, you know, insulting things which people hold uh, sacred, uh, you know, this is something di different. And, you know, it's intentional insult, not offense, not that they take offense to what you say, it's that you intended it. That's what I, I wish to see limited. It serves no purpose. And, you know, I've even read, uh, uh, obviously, John Stuart Mill's on liberty discussion on, on, on free speech and things. You know, great discussion he, he did. But even he saw the problem of, uh, even he saw the need to restrict, by some means, uh, gratuitous insult which, or, or, and demonization of minorities, or, or majorities, but mostly minorities, which causes them to be dis discriminated against in society, which is natural human nature. When you de demonize a minority, they'll start to be discriminated against, and there's nothing you can do to stop that. And that's, that's an unfortunate human nature. So this is, these are the dis discussions at hand, and I think that's why um, allow open discussion, open criticism, but do not allow insult, gratuitous insult of communities and demonization of them. I have to pass this on to Rabbi Cohen to see his opinion on this matter. I found it very interesting listening to all the opinions. I'm trying to give a, a little insight into what I would look at the question, how I would look at the question from the point of view of an Orthodox Jew, that is a Jew of Christ in his life in accordance with the Jewish religion. We talk about freedom of speech. Now we live in very liberal times comparatively to uh, what has been the position over the centuries historically. And in most what's called civilized countries, People nowadays are able to 
live their lives as they want, which is a very precious right um, to live their lives as they're religious people, to live their lives in accordance with their religion. And tied up with that is the question of freedom of speech, and that is the question of being able to say what you want, but what we mean by freedom of speech. Um, first of all, it would mean being able to express openly my own views about how I want to live my life and not have to be stifled in any way. Nobody should ever say to me, you cannot express views of how you want to live. That is very precious. That is a very basic aspect of freedom of speech. It goes further than that, the question of being able to criticize actions and philosophies and policies of my fellow man and other groups of people. And that again, that again is very, a very precious right um, if it is done in what is known as a civilized manner. But then it goes on further, before I say what to get on to the possibly the next stage is this. As a, an Orthodox Jew, I, there have been many occasions where I've had the opportunity to be involved in what is termed as interfaith discussions, and uh, very often groups of different faiths they like to have discussions and do some sort of comparison between one faith and another. And I always say that that should be avoided when it comes to creed and ritual and uh, religious belief. Everyone to their to themselves, and that again is part of freedom uh, and freedom of speech. To be able to live one own religion, one own way of life, and the way one wants to, to have to um, compare it with somebody else's way of life can be very difficult because um, if one is brought up to believe a certain way, a certain belief, one in the best way of the world will think that the other way is is not quite correct. So why discuss it? Better each one to their own and live happily alongside each other. But when it comes to, there are other aspects though of interfaith cooperation, and that is um, on matters of uh, humanitarian cooperation, compassion for one man for another, and that's where all are equal, everybody should help each other. Now, just to hone in on this question of, of which we're discussing, from a Jewish religious point of view, uh, a very important aspect of, of, of life is to consider one's fellow man and to not to do anything to upset one's fellow man. Um, and included in that requirement is not to say anything which will um, insult what the other person thinks is important, irrespective of what my own opinion is of whether that matter is important or precious or not. But if my fellow man, my fellow uh, colleague, thinks that that a certain subject is important, then obviously if I'm going to insult him, I'm hurting him very greatly, and that in that way, I'm transgressing the requirement, the religious requirement, to have compassion for one's fellow man. So, if one would want to say that one should extend the right of freedom of speech to the ability to insult one's fellow man personally, that anybody would understand, other speakers have mentioned that's wrong, but it should. I think it's quite obvious that also to insult something which one's fellow man feels is precious, is important, is equally wrong. Even though I personally might not think very much of the other person's opinion or 
the only importance that the other person attaches to that thing. So, therefore, uh, I think it would be fairly obvious that, from, certainly from a personal moral point of view, freedom of speech cannot extend to uh, saying anything which will insult my, my, my fellow man or insult anything which he thinks is important. I may criticize his philosophies, I may criticize his ideas, yes, but that doesn't, that doesn't incorporate, that doesn't include uh, insult. Of course, um, the, the problem is that, that uh, we're talking about whether it should be allowed to legislate for this sort of thing becomes very, very difficult because it, it does verge on the subjective and to legislate on the subjective is extremely difficult. So you have the question of legislation, but you have the question of personal conduct. So as far as personal conduct is concerned, it should be quite clear that one should never be allowed to do anything or say anything which will upset and insult something which is considered to be important by one's fellow man or one's fellow group. As to whether this can be incorporated in a legal, um, a legal code, well, of course, that, that, uh, ideally that should be the case, but it's, that uh, is not something that we here can, um, uh, can decide on because that, that is something up to the legislature. Can, you, can I take? Yeah. I just want to answer his question really quickly. Okay, then I'll let him know, and then we'll go to the. Um, I love your question. Like everyone, everyone thinks about it, but everyone says it. And um, from the Bible, Jesus never condemned. He challenged and he convicted. And what we've done as human beings is we've we put a hierarchy of sin in the Bible. There's, there's no like sin is sin. So. You see people go around saying, oh my god, I hate the gays. They should go around saying, I hate the lies. I hate people who are mean to each other. I hate people who don't read the Bible. That's not what God asks us to do. He asks us to challenge people's beliefs and then convict them. You can't force someone to believe in something they don't want to. If you do that, that's wrong. That's not what the Bible is. That, that's not what the Bible has asked. That is completely baseless. And so people going around going, oh my gosh, they, they put a hierarchy on sin. And that's what the Bible, what the Bible says is challenge and convict. If you've challenged and if you've convicted and that's not happening, then you go your own way. What they've done is they've pretty much discriminated, which is not fair, which is completely not biblical in any sense of the word. Again, I know we talk about putting laws to stop people, um, insulting people and making sure that everyone's all happy chappy and making sure that no one's offended by it. But then again, we have so many laws out there and people still get away with doing things. Clearly the law is not working. It's all about like when Jesus came, it was during the time where um, the Jews were being, um, there was uh, Romans were taxing the Jews and they were like, at that time, they wanted a political Messiah, but Jesus didn't come for that. He came for our hearts. That shows how crucial our heart is. There's no, there isn't an amount of law you can put up that will stop people from being mean because it's in our nature. That's that's who we are. It's about changing from the inside out, and that's what Jesus preached about. So putting laws, I'm sure they help, you know, here and there. But I've heard the saying, laws are made to be broken. You can always find a loophole. Laws are not effective. It's from the inside out. The change has to start from us, from the inside. Stop it. Can I take a question from the man in the white jump? Just, you can stand up and speak. I'll repeat your question. Do you, do you want to give the microphone to him? No, you just, just say it out loud. I'll repeat. Um, I, I'm a Christian, but I, I would like to say to ask this. Um, what do we mean by freedom of speech? It's been said on the panel that we must not offend it's said that we must be educated, we must educate ourselves before we speak, we must seek truth. Is freedom of speech about speaking about truth or is it about expressing yourself? The religious people on the panel who believe in a God, the God you believe in created you, gave you a brain. All that speech is, is an expression of thoughts. 
So therefore, if we constrain thoughts, are we then constraining the very natural essence in us? Every religious person on there believe in evil, Satan, Lucifer. He spoke against God and yet he is alive today because God allowed him freedom of expression. I hate what you believe. I find it disgusting what you believe, but I will fight for your right to say it. As long as there isn't an incitement to hatred, in terms of the offence that you give, offence isn't just about what is said, but also it is how someone else takes it. What if I want to express what I perceive to be truth and you decide to be offended by it? I think you should lose weight. I find that offensive. So therefore, I shouldn't say it. I think the concept of freedom of speech is a lot more complex than that which has been put forward so far. Um, because everyone is religious, apart from this lady here, I would like to hear what she has to say. And then maybe someone who's religious, who you would choose, Sean. Um, so I'd first like to start off by addressing the thing about kind of the connection between thought and speech. Um, there, there are separate rights in the Human Rights Act um, on freedom of conscience and freedom of speech. Uh, freedom of conscience, sorry, um, and freedom of belief. Um, so you are allowed to believe whatever you like and there can be no restrictions on that because it's inside your head and there shouldn't be um, external um, sort of, you shouldn't be imp implored to believe something that you don't believe, like no one should force me to try and believe in God. Those are the rights um, which are more, they kind of take a precedence over freedom of speech because they're so much easier to protect and so much more fundamental to a person's well-being. It's very easy for me to want to be able to say, oh, I hate black people or some such. Um, but I would not say that because it's illegal, obviously. So the freedom of speech is the, the one that you curtail in order to protect people's higher precedence right, which is their freedom of conscience and their freedom of sort of being autonomous and not persecuted. So that's the first thing I would say on that. Um, but the kind of thing you went on to say about uh, sort of, it's again, it's the line between offence um, and sort of the, the more incitement to hatred. And I would agree, and I'm actually going to put forward something that I, I just thought of now. I think that it should be illegal to depict Prophet Muhammad if it were getting to the stage where every day there was a cartoon in the Daily Mail which, you know, was a picture of Prophet Muhammad dressed as a pig or something, which would be really bad. If that were happening every day, that would be a systematic demonisation or insult. Um, it would be more than an insult. And I think that there's, there's got to be some way of formalising this, which I probably can't articulate now, but there's got to be a line between people making short jokes about me, which will always happen and I just have to be resilient against that, and people saying, oh, atheist evil, atheist evil, atheist evil, every second of every day. There's, there's got to be a line somewhere. Um, and obviously the courts would be the place to decide that. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I think Abdullah would like to keep saying. Yeah, I like a very quick comment. Um, uh, Satan is not free. To, uh, he doesn't have free speech because free speech means you don't get punished for it. But I think you know that Satan will get punished for it. <laughs> so, no, it's just a delayed punishment, you could say. Um, as for, um, you said thoughts and sp uh, sorry, thought, speech, action, they're all connected. This is the whole point, thought, speech, action, it's all connected. And the proof of this, I mean, the law understands this. You see, the, the English law being very pragmatic that it is, and American law and many other laws, ban incitement to violence, incitement to murder. 
But you could just say, hey, I didn't commit the murder. I just told the people. They, they are rational beings. They can decide for themselves. Yeah, but they know that you incite generally human beings being what they are. They're going to probably do, you know, one of them, one idiot is going to probably do it. Going to do a murder being, after being incited to do, to do so. So this is why the law has banned incitement to murder, incitement to violence, and so on and so forth. So again, the law is not, doesn't, doesn't believe that. That, uh, yeah, fine, you can say what you want, it has no connection. You can't separate thought and action, they are intrinsically linked. There's no, there's no action without thought. Um, as for, I, I want to make ex very, very, very clear, we're talking about uh, in, intention to insult, which in, according to law, a lot of the, the, the laws against, banning, uh, against uh, speech, look at intent. They don't look at the actual, uh, okay, uh, uh, racial hatred laws doesn't look at the effect. But other laws look at the intent. So did you intend this? If you did, if you intended this harassment, then you'll be uh, sanctioned by the law. So I'm, I'm saying intention to insult or demonize a community based on a commonly shared uh, aspect of their identity. That's what I'm saying should be banned. As for offense, I, you know, anyone could be offended by anything that's been said. I could be said a few things that have been offensive to people who might hold certain you know, theological doctrines different to mine. Without intention, I wasn't insulting them. But that's fine. I don't talk about offense. I talk about, you know, insult. I'll give you an example. You, uh, let's say you go to Italy, I think it's Italy, and someone bites their thumb at you. You won't know what that means. You think, probably think it's funny. But if someone tells you, oh, by the way, that's actually an insult in it Italy, oh, then you'll get angry. Then you'll get upset. The action itself didn't hurt you. It was that you find it was funny. But when you heard that another human being intended to degrade you or, or, or humiliate you, then you felt upset about that. Then you felt angry about that. It's a natural human response. And we're dealing with humans here. We're not dealing with angels. And as, as humans, we react to being humiliated or degraded. Lastly, um, the, just to answer Lola's point, so the law is not preventing um, hate speech. Well, the law's not preventing rape, murder, uh, you know, arson, burglary, so should we repeal the law? Should we abolish the law? No, we, we, we have to apply this law. It's about, about applying it. And of course, the, the racial hatreds, uh, hatred uh, laws are, are working efficiently, sometimes even too efficiently. Uh, we're seeing the BNP were forced to accept non-white members, for example. They couldn't discriminate, for example. Even the EDL have to pretend to be multicultural or whatever. You know, okay, that's disputed, but, but they, they have to, even though most of their members are pretty much all, all white and they have a few token people of different ethnic groups, even they had to pretend to be not racist, basically. So, um, in, in, during the 80s, racism was very rampant in this country. In the 90s, it was, it was still very rampant, but it's, it's kind of, it's calmed down after people have been silenced from openly preaching racism as they used to do in the past. Now, we've still got a way to go, but it helps. It works, you know, to some degree. It, it helps. That's why we have laws. So that's all, all I want to say. I, I, as I said, I want to make very clear, open criticism, um, open debate. In fact, I re think I remember uh, my organization hosted a debate between Carlton McDonald, who's a friend of yours, on, on the topic of Jesus and, and Islam and things like this. And there was criticism of the Quran in it, there was criticism of the Bible in it. And, you know, we came in amicably and we left amicably, and that's fine because we did it respectfully. We, we were having a go at each other, you know, you know but. Uh, intellectually, but not, we weren't degrading each other as human beings who hold beliefs sacred. And that's what I'm advocating. Yeah. Would you to come in? I, I need to see clear something. Uh, I, one of the books that was given to me, um, The Ideal Muslim, I don't know if anybody's read that book. Anybody? Anybody? The Ideal Muslim? I think, it's a, I think it's a great literature. I just need you to explain what this means to me. The active Muslim, he mixes with people and puts up with their insults, is the subheading. The active Muslim mixes with people and bears their insults with patience because he is a man with a mission who has a message to deliver. Whoever undertakes this important mission should be prepared to accept the fact that he will have to make sacrifices and be patient with the foolish ideas that people have. Their bad behaviour, their suspicions and hard-hearted natures, their laziness and slow response to truth. Their focus on their own salvation interest and cut it there. I'm struggling. Can you explain, because I may have missed it, but explain what that actually means? because I'm not Muslim, I'm Christian, but what does that mean um, in your belief system? 
Okay, first of all, um, you're quoting a book, uh, basically he's quoting what an author's view is on an issue here. No, I mean, I would presume somebody who preaches... It's commentary. It's commentary. Yeah, yeah, it's commentary. I would presume... It's explain. I mean, it, does it have any basis? Or? Yeah, I'll come to answering okay. that. But what I'm trying to say here is, if you're going to examine a religion, you look at the text. So I would expect somebody to come up with a Quran or a prophetic tradition and then I say... Think they, they are referring to the Quran, but this is a commentary on the passage within the Quran. No, this actually is basically talking about the character of somebody who's going out and presenting Islam to people. And while presenting Islam to people, they'll be criticised and you need to be able to take that on board. That's basically what it's speaking about. Okay. So it's not actually talking about an ayah or hadith yet. But I mean, like, for example, if I was to examine Christianity, if I was to look in Leviticus 24, it says, for anybody who blasphemes against the Lord, a community should stone them to death. Okay. That's examining text, that's examining literature and saying, okay, well, according to your text, if somebody blasphemes or insults your religion, the community should stone them. Now, what have you got to say about that? So if you want a Muslim response... Are you, are you, are you wanting me to respond? You could respond after I finish. So that would be like an academic you know, examination of literature, not a commentary. Now, basically, what we're saying is, I'm not objecting against that commentary. I'm actually saying... It sounds like it. No, no, no. I'm putting it into context. I'm saying when quoting Islamic literature, you quote, quote Quran and Hadith, you can't quote a general book, like I've just quoted biblical literature. But, what I'm, okay, now what I'm saying is, I'm not justifying a violent Muslim response to an insult to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So I'm saying, okay, these videos have come out, these cartoons have come out, now Muslims shouldn't react aggressively and violently. And, you know, I'm first to condemn the violent reaction that came from aspects of the Muslim community. And they should take this advice and, you know, be strong and deal with it in the best of manners. But what we're actually discussing here is should the people who are mocking a religion be allowed to do so in the first place? We're not talking, you're talking about the reaction, you know, we should internally be nice to ourselves, we should overcome this stuff. The reaction's fine, I'm with you with the reaction. We as Muslims, or we as people of faith, need to rise above any attack made against us and react in an appropriate manner. But we're saying what is the cause of that reaction and is that cause allowed in the first place in a civil society? Well, I'm glad that we agree and that you don't feel insulted by what I've said. Um, what I'm talking about is, is what is outside of uh, my control as a Christian. And I do think it's my responsibility and for the little that I know or have read in your community. That is, that there is a similar ideology that there is self-control is paramount when faced with adversity. Is, is that something that we agree on? Okay. So, if we're in a situation where insults are flying, I have no control of that. So for me to say that I believe in free choice, um, and I believe that you do too, no? It depends what you mean by free choice. Okay. People I don't have the freedom to go and rape somebody if that's my free choice. Well, 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 well you do, but it would be illegal. <laughs> so, so, so. so, that's not free choice. Free choice. Okay, so what you, you Well, you basically, people can do exactly what they want. There are laws of the land, uh, there, are, there is a moral compass that I subscribe to and I suspect you subscribe to. It's not identical, but we believe in the higher power that governs what we do. So, uh, Raymond, using your example, would be wholly inappropriate for the belief systems that we belong to. So that's freedom restricted by religious belief. But, it, but, it, but it's, that's our moral compass. Yeah, but, I can't, but I can't, I can't override anybody else's. And I'm not trying to. All I can do is go through what I do. Now, going back to the point on insults, what I'm struggling with here is how will I know what is insulting to you? Or, and it is what is insulting to you as insulting to another? It is exactly the same thing as insulting to your Muslim brother. I don't know, because two statements could, could have a completely different impact. Um, on, on, uh, on two different individuals from the same belief system. So when you talk about criticism, criticisms are allowed, or insults are, or well, somebody who's criticised can see that as an insult, and some another person may not see that as an insult. So you need to be quite crisp in what you mean by that and how one is able to measure that. Sorry, sir. Yes, just on the question of um, 
and you can insult, or you can criticize, sorry. Uh, one can criticize a view, one can criticize a philosophy, one can criticize a way of life. Well, if it um, verges on the personal, if it verges on the, uh, in, uh, once you insult a way of life, once you mock a way of life, then that becomes personal. That should not be something that should be allowed. And as I said earlier, I mean, it's not something that's easily legislated against. We can't talk about personal, uh, what one has to adopt as a personal moral standard. But I think the personal moral standard should be I can criticize um, the other person's philosophy or view or whatever it is, political view, but not let it verge onto personal, something which will be a personal insult. Um, if you um, mock, that tends to become personalized. There's a difference between criticism and mock. Can I pass that to Abdullah, please? Because he wants to be I want to respond to his point. Um, I'm going to reiterate for the third time. Uh, insult is not based on the uh, on saying of the recipient. It's the intention of the person that gives it. And we, we know this: the public order offences in, in England. Uh, I, I state, I quote: "A person is guilty of an offence if, with intent to cause a person harassment, alarm, or distress, he uses threatening, abusive, or insulting words or behaviour." So the law says. With intent, you must prove intent, and of course that it was insulting words, you know, deliberately insulting words were used. So the law already has that definition there. I think that's a good definition. I, you know, that's what that was my my kind of my yardstick. But to answer your your point, um, as Muslims, we are not meant to react uh, violently to insult. The Prophet Muhammad was abused horrendously, uh, violently attacked as well in in, uh, in Mecca, and he did not respond. Uh, violently, or um, you know, start getting angry, uh, angry, even angry about, not even visibly angry. Uh, he didn't, didn't display that. Unfortunately, what you see in the Muslim world is that uh, post-colonialism, they feel very humiliated. They feel that you know that they don't have any control of their own destiny. They have puppet governments, which are uh, which are in the employ uh, of uh, of various foreign foreign powers, and so they feel powerless. You see, if you're an American or a British person, and something bad happens, uh, so, you know, you could trust your government to deal with it. Your government has your, your best interests at hand. But if your government doesn't have your best interests at hand, and if it has interests of a foreign power at hand, then you're going to feel, uh, you know, humiliated. You're going to feel debased. You're going to feel uh, that, you know, you, you're, you're powerless. So then, when this foreign power, when when you hear of insults about your what you hold sacred coming from this uh, foreign power, it's kind of like rubbing salt into the wound. You know, kicking you when you're down. I, you know, I think they should have exercised restraint. I think they shouldn't have, you know, um, made these, 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 you know, violent demonstrations. But I like to draw you to one thing. In Channel Four, there was this documentary, or supposed documentary, um, of uh, Tom Holland, you know, what, what, you know, the untold story of Islam, right, where he basically indulged in some wonderful speculation as to, uh, you know, Prophet Muhammad didn't exist and maybe aliens started Islam. Who knows? So, um, hey, can you disprove it? You can't. <laughs> maybe. Huh? So anyway. So, did you see any Muslims rioting about that, or even demonstrating about that? No, because we understood he was exercising intellectual criticism. I mean, well, I think he was absurd, but he has a right to exercise intellectual criticism. That's fine, no problem. We, you know, but uh, gratuitous insult, drawing cartoons about either Muslims or, or Jews uh, in the past, those things are a different matter entirely. And I wouldn't even have got um, in, uh, interested in discussing the issue of, uh, to, uh, of, um, of calling for some kind of restriction on speech if I wasn't concerned that it would lead to discrimination and perhaps even violence against Muslims, uh, uh, violence against uh, buildings of Muslims. And that's why I'm actually involved in this debate. Um, that's all I'm really concerned. If actually, if, if it's only a minority of people who were saying it and no one really cared about what they, what they were saying, then I'd probably ignore it. I wouldn't feel threatened. But because we feel threatened, we have to come out here and say, look, you have to regulate this because we, we really don't want a repeat of the mass hysteria that's happened in the past. And it happened to everybody. You know, Irish, blacks, Jews, Jews um, have suffered you know, the, 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 the brunt, unfortunately. And now, just, just to kind of illustrate what I mean by tolerance, uh, my organization, the so Muslim Debate Initiative, we invited uh, an atheist speaker called Brendan Lavore. I don't know if you've heard of him. No, all right. Uh, he's a professor, anyway. We invited him to East London Mosque, one of the biggest mosques, uh, the biggest mosques in Europe. 
and we had a debate on does Allah exist? We even made it you know, deliberate, does Allah exist? Not even does God exist, does Allah exist? We had a public debate, it was 600 people, mostly Muslim, few atheists came down and it was amicable and it was friendly, you can see on our website and that was great, that was intellectual debate, that was intellectual criticism and this, this guy was denying God's existence, um, attacking the concept of God's existence in a mosque. Of course the media didn't show you that because they didn't sell newspapers, right? Right? Well, Muslims actually having an intellectual debate in a mosque? Oh, we, we can't show that. So, this is what I mean by tolerance. This is what I mean by accepting cri intellectual criticism. <coughs> but gratuitous insult and demonization of unity? Something else. Okay, Can I take a question from the lady uh, at the end of the row? I'm just wondering, we've talked a lot about insulting and about, like, you know, especially about Islam, but I was wondering about your opinions on why Islam is so There's like the libertarian type people and the sort of the media who will go, oh, well, we don't need to take into account these new people's, like, they're all just new and they're a minority, we can stamp on them. Which I think has meant that there has been a very, and rightly, um, vocal reaction from the Muslim community saying, hey, actually, this is like a big deal to us, can you, can you like, listen to us? Um, whereas, you know, I can easily insult Christianity because, you know, they've been around forever. Like, they don't care because they don't have to feel threatened. And that's, that's got to be the basis of it, I think. Lola, you come and then we'll go to the man in the shirt. Um, I definitely understand. Who, who asked the question? I, I, the on. I, I definitely understand what you mean. But, like, if, I, if we move the context, so in Nigeria, churches have been burnt. So they're getting the brunt of, like, 
the force. But I definitely understand what, um, what you're saying. I think it's the whole like 9-11 thing. I think people, people would just, again, this is why I go back to it, it's the content of your heart. If your heart was in the right place, that happened, you'd be able to realise that it wasn't the whole Muslim community. It was a couple of people. It was a very small minority. But people don't want to do that. They want to think they can hate because we just have hate in our heart. And so once we can get the right mindset, then like having issues about should we say this, should we insult other people will not be a problem. I forget my other point now, but oh my god, so good. Oh, if you remember it, you can come in later. Yeah. Can I take the question and the man in the show? Yeah. yeah. Um, basically, there are a number of cartoons posted in newspapers every day that mock politicians, they mock other countries, they mock the French. Why on earth should Islam be exempt from satirical insults? Uh, in fact, secondly, if you look at South Park, they uh, regularly insult everyone, it's particularly Islam to be defended. Also, you mentioned about intellectual criticism. Do I have to have a degree before I can criticise Islam? Do I have to have a PhD before I can criticise Islam? Um, I'm not allowed to criticise Islam unless I'm dyslexic. It's a very elitist and snobbish attitude you seem to have there, but you have to be a certain intelligence before you can criticise Islam. So, so the question, uh, the first question was, uh, people are insulted every day. Why does it, is why is Islam treated uh, special specifically? Pardon? Specifically in the context of satire. Okay, specifically in the context of satire, and you don't see the Muslims responding as vigorously when someone else is insulted. And yeah. Yeah. Okay, is, is this directed to Abdullah then? Okay, can you? <laughs> okay, um, I think you misunderstood what intellectual criticism is. You don't have to be an academic to criticize intellectually. I mean, that's the elephant in the room here. I mean, um, anyone can uh, criticize intellectually. What it means is that you're looking at the facts, you're looking objectively at the issue, you're not looking at subjectively to, I want to degrade those people because I think, worth, I think bad of them. That's degrading people is hate speech, yeah? But criticizing ideas because you wanna, you wanna come to the truth, you want to discourse, you wanna debate, that's intellectual criticism. You don't need a degree, you know, even you know, people in, in, uh, in uh, primary school can do that, it's not a problem, right? So I I'm not saying that at all. Um, as for Islam, I, I'm not asking for Islam to be exempt. I'm actually asking for every belief which is held to be sacred, not to be pilloried, and, uh, and the people who hold on to that belief to be uh, degraded and viewed as either a threat to society, or viewed as subhuman, or, or, or just viewed as, uh, as there's something wrong with them, that they're not, they don't have the full faculties of a human being. This kind of demonization, uh, this kind of, uh, of gratuitous insult, it serves no rational purpose. If you, can, if you can tell me a rational purpose why people should insult each other, I'd accept it, but I haven't heard one. It's just from, I feel like it, I must say it. Well, I, we feel like many, you know, doing many things in society, but there's repercussions. You try talking to your boss, you try telling your boss what you really think of him, you'll see what, you know, repercussions, right? So this is the, this is the situation. I'm not, asking, I'm not asking for Islam to be very special that only it deserves uh, not to be attacked. I'm saying that any belief system which is held to be sacred, including atheism, or it's, it's a belief or unbelief system, anyway, um, shouldn't be pilloried and attacked or gratuitously. Okay. And that's what I'm saying. And just, just, just lastly, um, the issue is not image depiction. Right, South Park um, actually um, had this uh, this episode called the Super Best Friends, but it was, and had all these Krishna, Jesus, and uh, and all kinds of people, including including the so-called Prophet Muhammad cartoon. No one had a riot over that. Do you know why? Because he wasn't being insulted. It's very simple. Muslims weren't being insulted. It was pillaring all the religions. That's true, but it but it wasn't insulting gratuitously. Uh, you know, um, people for for having um, X, Y, and Z religion. That's the difference. Um, sorry, sorry. Sorry, I was just going to um, ask a very short question, which is, um, do you think that, so David Cameron is depicted as like a condom on the back of the G2 magazine, he's a condom head, um, and that's really insulting to him, and obviously he's not as sacred as the Prophet Muhammad, but could, um, if it were like in context, could we... Um, to pick the Prophet Muhammad in some similar way, and if not, then should we make it illegal to depict David Cameron like that? Okay, all right. Um, we have li uh, libel and slander laws 
that appropriately deal with insulting people as individuals. So if you, if you can demonstrate emotional damage um, or distress or loss of reputation, uh, that can be discussed and debated. And, and whether there's public interest or not on this issue, he's a politician, there's public interest because he's a politician ruling the country, he needs to be accounted as a leader. We believe in accounting leader too, that's fine. But to actually start demonizing, let's say, average Joe, or maybe even some, some, of these, some celebrities who doesn't want to go in the public eye, but is uh, their privacy is invaded, <laughs> like uh, Kate Middleton and her pictures, <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and the pictures, uh, uh, revealing pictures, that was slammed down, that was clamped down upon. Why? She felt upset about it, it was hurting her, there's no freedom of speech for the French newspaper to degrade someone like that. That's, 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 the, that's where the, the line is drawn, so I hope that's answered the question. Okay. Can I take the question just here, please? Uh, yeah. um, it's more of a clarity question, but... Um, so I'm not really backtracking, but it was something that was discussed before by the two gentlemen on the right. Um, it was discussed about how you were saying that, about the difference kind of between insult and criticism. And um, I'll just give a, a, a silly example. Um, for example, I know a lot of people have pets, for example, dogs and cats. Now, I can't stand dogs. Now, if I go about, let's say it's a general, cons in general consensus, if I say I hate dogs, it's not being frowned upon, it's just your own opinion. Now, even though I'm in, obviously being Muslim, I'm in support of these photo, um, the, this movie or whatever is not being released. But my point is, where does this bar go where a generalized law, a generalized law can personalize itself with each individual? And where does that where does that line come in? Because let's say, for example, if someone's a practicing a, a person of faith who practices a lot, and then there's another who doesn't. What the person who practices more will take more offence to something than the other. So where does, where is that line? So, so where do you draw the line? Yeah. Where is this generalised law that will accommodate for everyone? Just, just very, all right, um, a reason why I asked to, to answer this is I want to reiterate a thing again for perhaps a second time. Public order offence, um, Criminal Justice and Public Order Act 1994, and also there's a Public Order Act 1986. Again, a, a person is guilty of an offence if, with intent, to cause a person harassment, alarm, or distress, he a, uses threatening, abusive, or insulting words of behaviour or disorderly behaviour, or displays any writing, sign, or, or other visible representation which is threatening, abusive, or insulting thereby causing that, uh, that or another person uh, harassment, alarm or distress. That's, that's the law. The courts will look into that, each case, as did you intend to insult and did it cause harassment, alarm or, or in, in distress, was intended to cause harassment, alarm and distress. I think, since we're having a legal discussion here, the courts will decide what is uh, intent to insult, whether your behaviour was insulting, did it cause harassment, alarm or distress. But you know why? Because it already does. No, it said with intent. So the court has to show that you, if you were the person doing it, intended to insult. So you see, so it doesn't, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter who gets okay. It doesn't matter who gets offended by it. It's whether you had the intention to do that. That's already in British law. It's already done. I, I don't see no problem with, with implementing that for other things. So, so, so the, if, if it is a legal debate, because I, I I'm with this gentleman. Slight confusion. We would then have to, this cartoonist, this irreverent cartoonist, we would have to then decide whether that individual decided to be insulting or funny then. Is that correct? Both. Um, so again, it's outside of your control, you have to agree, because you won't know what they intended until they had put forth the defense. And then from that, if they decide, it's possibly why comedians get away with so much uh, funny, you have to then decide what the intent of that comedian is or that cartoonist is in order to get an understanding of whether or not they are acting illegally or inappropriately. Is that, is that is my understanding that correct? I think common sense, I'll say, um, it's very, very briefly, so I'll keep hogging the mic now. Um, I, I think common sense will dictate whether, you, whether something is deliberately insulting or not intended to be a joke. I mean, generally, common sense serves us very well for, for most cases. And in those few cases where it is morally ambiguous or ambiguous as to intent, we take it to the court. That's what the courts do. They already do it. And the court will decide whether intent was to show. And because intent is hard to show, in most cases, we'll be let off. You see? But when it, intent is clear, 
then they will be punished by, by, by the courts. And as I said, the only reason I'm discussing this, I'm not, I'm not here to, 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 to say we must change the law of England, but what, but what I am saying is that if you're asking my, if you're asking some advice for, oh sorry, <laughs> I fell off. Okay. Right. If you're asking advice as to how we should approach these matters to prevent um, human beings from being mistreated, discriminated against, or feel humiliated, then we already have uh, the uh, you know legal principles in place which really do that. And all we, all I'm really calling for is the equalisation of a person's re religious identity with their racial quote unquote identity. That's really all I'm calling for, I right? Have to, I have to That's it, thank you. Can I take the question from the man in the glasses, please? Yeah. 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 Thank you. Uh, and we're talking about lines here, and I was just trying to establish where the lines were in three ways. Uh, the one way in which I would just like to establish it is this intellectual barrier, and we haven't really we haven't really addressed that. So I'd like to bring the example of Salman Rushdie, who brought a very eloquent, um, though hypothetical, uh, argument about Islam. And nonetheless, was uh, was con uh, convicted for to die in the fatwa uh, issue uh, following that. The, the second way is um, the Denmark, uh, the Danish newspaper, uh, which depicted Muhammad or depicted a Muslim uh, wearing uh, a, a, a turban, uh, which which includes a bomb, or which do doubles as a bomb. Uh, why why would that pass uh, beyond uh, satire and legitimate criticism for? Isolated, though they were isolated, um, uh, violent acts uh, committed by uh, people adhering to, or allegedly adhering to Muslim faith. Um, and I probably you would say that they are not true Muslims. Um, and the third um, area is basically just a reiteration of what the, the gentleman in the, in the corner there said with the hat is how would you prevent that um, from preventing uh, religious scholars or religious preachers um, from making. Uh, well, how would you prevent it from preventing them from making arguments against certain groups, such as Muslims, uh, such as sorry, uh, homosexuals uh, or, or gays, such as them speaking up against gay rights? Why would? Uh, how would you stop it from preventing you from doing that? Wouldn't you be afraid, as somebody who is a religious person and probably believes does not believe in, in gays or believes it's a choice or whatever? Uh, uh, how would you stop um, such a thing from? Infringing upon your <coughs> will, uh, your your desire to express this. Which panel is that? Anyone you, you choose. I, 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 I do want to. Yeah, if you would respond. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. First of all, I'll I'll deal with this the last part, which was, for example, with homosexuals. How you know how could they be protected? Now, see what wouldn't be a fair criticism if somebody got a five-year-old boy and a man and stripped both naked and printed it out and saying this is what homosexuals want. Why? Because that's not what, well, that's not what homosexuals are calling for. They're not asking to do over a five-year-old boy who's naked. That would be a misrepresentation of homosexual beliefs or values. And therefore, that would be slammed down straight away and would be permitted. Now, if you look at what, we, what we're saying, we're not saying that you can't, you know, you can't examine the Quran and say that okay, we believe that these teachings are, you know, violent and so forth. What we're saying is, when you take the mick, and what the Danish cartoons have done, they've taken a sacred religious figure, Prophet Muhammad, and made him out into being a suicide bomber. What Salman Rushdie has done in his satanic verses, he's taken the wives of the Prophet and said they, you know, they, he used the word bakka, which was the traditional old term for makka, and saying this is a place where there were whores and they used to squeal, squeal with pleasure. This is clearly insulting, isn't it? It's not an academic critique. Just, just clarify, he made, he made this into a book, but this is an intellectual discourse. No, it's... Well, no, first of all, he claims it to be a fictional book, so it's not an academic account. And secondly, when you're using the same names and the same setting and the same situa situation, he's not academically criticising. He's not saying, you know, academically, we're the wives of the Prophet prostitutes or not. He's making clear, insulting comments. And this is what we're saying, that that's the problem. If he had really saying, look, I believe that these women that were married 1400 years ago weren't loyal women, and this is the reason why I don't believe they are. And, you know, he academically criticized it. That would be tolerated because that's an academic criticism. Just like I might criticize, I don't believe that homosexuality is a natural, you know, is a natural thing or whatever. If I argue something to that effect, that's an academic criticism. But when I strip a naked five-year-old boy in a 
grown man and say this is homosexuality, that is not a true representation of homosexual beliefs or values. And I shouldn't be allowed to do that. And there are laws that should protect people from doing that. That passes to Jen. <clears throat> so, uh, with the homosexual thing, um, it actually, the guy in that point earlier, which I didn't really come to, was um, should preachers be able to say, I hate gays? Well, no. Should they be able to say, I think gay religion, uh, gay religion, um, so gay marriage, a gay marriage uh, shouldn't be allowed for this reason, this reason, this reason, this reason. That's okay, except quite often it's an underlying um, hatred of gays, which um, which makes them say that. So, and I think that the current discourse is actually quite borderline on as to whether um, people are being just just using it as a guy as a disguise for genuine um, homophobia. So it, it does need to be kind of looked at more closely, I think, but only in the same way that um, we should monitor how people in the media are, you know, there is, there is a growing undercurrent of anti-Muslim sentiment. Um, what was your other point? Um, would you allow cartoons? Uh, what, what, what would be my response oh, to cartoons? Of so the, the, the whole point with satire, I, actually, I don't remember the point. Um, so I was going to say, I think it is plausibly possible, I would pose to the other people on the panel, to make an academic insult. The uh, example I would give of this, I hate, I can't believe I'm actually doing this, but I'm going to quote Richard Dawkins' book. Um, I, don't, I don't know the exact quote, but he says something along the lines of, the God of the Old Testament is the most bigoted, vengeful, um, ruthless, blah, blah, he hates women, he hates homosexuals, blah, 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 blah. And obviously Christians would say, oh, well, the New Testament, blah, 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 whatever. Um, the, the point is that that is him explicitly going on a rant about how that God is an evil creature. And he's doing so using things that he has read, perhaps in a you know, from, from the wrong background because he's not got his heart open to God when he was reading the Bible, so he misinterpreted it as being nasty God or whatever. Um, <laughs> um, so, like, um, but the point is that it is directly insulting and I think that there, there will be corner cases like that, but you get corner cases like that everywhere in the law. So it's not necessarily an inherent reason that you shouldn't, um, that you, you should ban insults to a particular like, direct insults um, because you can do it in a non-academic setting and it would still be okay for example i would say like certain cartoons like political cartoons or even someone like a comedian who says something offhand about god which is an insult it still might be a valid thing which is insulting but i think that unless it causes massive outrage, it's probably um, going to be uh, come under what you would say as um, not an intent to insult, but an intent to actually, actually discuss it. And it's just had the collateral damage of doing some ins insulting. So maybe it would be permissible within what, what the others are suggesting. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily agree, but I think you might be wrong if <laughs> in certain circumstances. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to talk about what you said about Richard Dawkins. I have read, I have heard that, um, what's that, that quote? That passage, yeah. I have heard it. And again, I think it links in with what you said about Leviticus. And I can't stress how much you have to put things in context. And I think a lot of the times why we discuss things like freedom of speech or are they insulting me is because people don't take the time to put things in context. The reason why, I, I'm, I'm going to look at everyone here, the reason why I think um, Muhammad isn't like to be, isn't supposed to be depicted is so that it doesn't co cause idolatry, is that right? Idolatry. Idolatry, yeah. Uh, is, that, is that correct? Am I, yeah. See, with that knowledge, I know why I shouldn't depict him. So it's not a thing of, oh my gosh, they've asked me not to depict him, but depict him anyways. Once you take the time out to figure out why, then it's not a big issue anymore. You have to take things in context. There are no religious people who are homophobes. There are religious people who are homophobes. The Bible does not endorse homophobia at all, in the slightest. 
people come under the guise. Did I did I upset anyone? Oh, okay. No. Like people, people, people have what they have in their heart, anyways, and they will pick anything to validate what they feel. And the Bible is not to be used that way. The Bible is the standard. You do not validate how you feel with the Bible. The Bible validates how you should feel. Okay. It's not the opposite Can I let Abdullah uh, have one? Then we'll have one last question with man here. Um, in, in answer to the, to the gentleman over there who asked uh, those, those questions, interesting, interesting points. We oh, there already exist laws which um, prevent you from um, inciting hatred against homosexuals. Already exists. You can't you can't incite hatred against homosexuals. So as as, as I said, all I'm doing is really trying to equalise uh, these these things. So having race race hatred laws. Um, you know, homophobia related laws. So, um, inciting hatred against uh, communities of believers, Jews, Christians, Muslims, based on their identity, their religious identity, uh, or demeaning them, it should also be, um, suffer the same kind of legal sanction. But I'll, I'll put it like this when you talk about satire, I, I call this, you know, I just, just made it up, but the, the, the Jewish test, the Jew test. Would you do a cartoon about Jews in the same way? Right? Because we know of people who in the past have done cartoons, cartoons against, against Jews, and we know, what we know how much hatred they had, and we know what they were trying to incite amongst the population, and they were successful at it. They were successful in inciting a hatred against a you know, defenseless, uh, innocent minority who was just trying to you know, live peacefully in, amongst the society. But there was so much hatred against them, there was films done against them, uh, you know, Das, das Weiger Jud, was, was one of those films was uh, talking about oh look at the Jews look how they live in our community they are you know they're, they're dirty look at they're, they're poor they they want to steal our money all this all this stuff we've been here we've done that before that would be banned that's what I want to, be, to see banned I don't want to see anyone go through what you know what the, the the Jews did this is when we when we say never again we should mean never again right and that's not no, no, let's do it again for another eth ethnic group and see if that goes okay no um, you know try and nip it in the bud lastly. Um, with, with Dawkins, what, uh, his, his statement, um, it's, 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 fair, it's fair criticism, it's his point, it's his opinion. Uh, if you look in Islamic history, we've had, for example, there was this uh, 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 Jewish scholar living in uh, Andalusia, which is uh, Iberia, or Spain or Portugal, and he was called it being Quraysh, and he basically said that the Prophet Muhammad was Meshuggah, which, probably, which as, as a Hebrew means crazy. Right? And he wrote it, he wrote it on a book, published that book, published it in an Islamic land. Right? And nothing happened to him. He wasn't attacked or killed or, or forced uh, under, you know, uh, under some kind of Inquisition, uh, uh, Muslim Inquisition. What happened was that another Muslim scholar, a, a Muslim scholar called Ibn Hazm, wrote a refutational book against him. So one guy writes a book, another guy writes a book back refuting him. That's how Islam dealt with intellectual criticism. That's how we, we, we welcome that. That's no problem. But as I said, demonization is, is something different and it should be um, sanctioned for the protection and well-being of you know, all members of society, whatever religion they might be. Okay, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we don't have time for any more questions due to speakers having to go back to where they came from. So uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you all for coming. I hope you've learned something. I know this debate could go on all night. And I'd like to thank all of the panellists for coming here and uh, telling everyone your uh, opinion on this matter. And I've enjoyed myself. I hope everyone else has en enjoyed themselves. I'd like to thank all the volunteers for helping and everyone else. If you've done anything to help this event come to pass, I'd like to thank you.